Hey, warm good evening to one and all. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you to the 44th webinar, February session 2024. And it is a glorious moment to extend my warm wishes to all of you on behalf of the Global Forum for Young Philosophers. First of all, with the great happiness, I welcome Professor Aditya Kumar Mohande, Professor in the Department of Philosophy, Central University of Tripura. On behalf of the entire team of GFIP, with the whole heartedly, I welcome you to our pro forum, sir. And uh, I welcome our patron, Professor Sriklam Nair, Professor and Head, Department of Philosophy, Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, Kaladi, and the Director, International School for Sri Shankaracharya Studies, Kerala, who has always been the energy and inspiration for us. With extreme love and great joy, I welcome you to our forum, dear ma'am, and today's seminar. And at this pleasant moment, I welcome my good friend, Dr. Lin, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, Manipur University, to introduce the theme and the speaker. I'm extremely happy, dear Lin, for uh, agreeing our invitation. And welcome to our forum. And finally, I welcome all the professors, academy chefs, the scholars, students, and all of the rescued participants to the program. So right away, we are moving to our first session. And uh, I'm inviting Lin to introduce the theme and uh, the speaker. Over to you, dear Lin. Thank you very much, Simshini. Thank you for GFYP for giving me this opportunity. <clears throat> A very good evening to one of all present. Uh, the learning speaker for today's session is Professor Aditya Kumar Mohanji. He is currently a professor in the Department of Philosophy, Central University of Tripura. He was also a former head of Center of Advanced Study in Philosophy, Utkal University, Bhubaneswar. Professor Mohanji has to his credit 11 books and many research publications in the field of Indian philosophy, excuse me, sorry, ethics and religion in many renowned journals. He is also a recipient of many prestigious awards like Janase Vashil, Excellency Award, Samaj Ratna Award, to mention few. Today, Professor Mohanty will be speaking on the topic, Is Out Can a Value Dynamics? A brief introduction to the topic would be that is out is considered a fallacy, also known as a fact value dichotomy in philosophy. Simply put, is the error of deriving a value statement from a factual statement. It is the error of assuming that just because things are in a certain way, they ought to be that way. So for example, everybody smokes, so they ought to keep smoking. So here we are deriving a prescriptive statement, we ought to keep smoking from a descriptive one, everybody smokes. Initially posed as a problem by David Hume, Hume was very clear on his stance that you cannot deduce moral conclusions featuring moral, moral words such as ought from non-moral premises. Hume arrived at this problem while arguing against moral rationalism that rationality alone cannot produce moral judgments. The implication of such an irresolvable problem in philosophy is that it would make it really difficult to derive any system of ethics from facts about the world. So many philosophers have tried to address and solve this problem. For instance, Richard Rorty tried to solve the is our problem by explaining that moral judgments are not description of the world and that they are nothing more than prescription of actions. And as prescriptions, we are not concerned with whether they are true or not, but with how they can be applied universally. So Philippa Foot, on the other hand, sidesteps the problem and addresses it differently by claiming that one may derive an ought from an is given some certain conditions. So for moral judgments can be evaluative judgments and need not always be prescription. And in such evaluative moral judgments, it, <clears throat> one can derive moral conclusions from factual statements. So these are some of the responses to the is our problem. Excuse me. <clears throat> so on the other hand, Kant, uh, whether ought can imply and can, can be traced back to Kantian basic assumption of moral theory. So one of the basic presuppositions of any ethical theory for Kant is that an ought should imply can. So an agent has a moral obligation to perform a certain action only if it is possible for him to perform that action. So this means that any ethical theory cannot be justified if it implies an agent have duties to perform certain action that they are unable to perform it. So the ambivalence of such a principle is primarily because such principle opens room for many interpretations. 
So the tenability of such a principle may depend on how we understand the term can. So for instance, can here can be understood as to refer to physical possibility in accordance with laws of nature. So we can expect an agent to have moral obligations to do certain things if it is physically and in accordance with the law of nature that he can perform that action. So this is acceptable and plausible in a way. For we cannot expect people to have moral obligations to do certain things if one is physically incapable of performing to do that. So on the other hand, the principle seems less plausible if can is used to refer to what an agent can do given the resources available to her. So if an agent has no resources, then she cannot. So this would mean that an agent has no moral obligation to do something if he does not have any resources to do so. So if I don't have any money to repay any resources as such, then I do not have any moral obligations to repay the money that I've borrowed, given that I don't have any resources. So these are some of the issues in is out can relation. So when so this lecture with Professor will enlighten us. So he, some of the issues that he will discuss is when can a moral prescription be translated into practice? So for if moral prescriptions cannot be put into practice, it becomes morally insignificant. So the problem here is how one can make a transition from knowledge to practice. So there are, these are some of the philosophical problems which Professor will be dealing in this lecture. So I would like to request Professor Ajit Kumar Mohanty to kind of enlighten us with this intricate relation of is, out, and can, the value dynamics. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Namaskar to all of you. Uh, it's not a formal, uh, at the outset, uh, what I'm going to say is not formal. This is what I really mean. Uh, I'm, I really did not know that <coughs> such a forum exists. And, uh, and I don't know how I was picked up and I feel greatly, uh, really privileged and to be a part of this ongoing e academic event. It's a real an opportunity to share my considered thoughts, or considered views with uh, my philosophy kindreds. Meaning not only the students and teachers of philosophy, but lovers of philosophy, those who are philosophically disposed to discuss certain fundamental or seminal issues in philosophy, which are relevant for anyone and everyone irrespective of time and climb. So I uh, also feel it is heartening to see my friends, Mr. Panit Silvam and Sri Kalaji, whom I met a few days back last month and could be many others which are not visible to me. But it's really heartening to be with uh, our companions, uh, academic interests on this occasion. Besides meeting the young and uh, boarding talents in philosophy. And the, as it has already been said by Dr. Lin, she has opened up the issues and uh, it becomes my uh, bounden uh, rather uh, compulsions to uh, try to address the issues pertaining to is, ought and can. Am I perfectly audible to all of you, friends? Yes or no? Yes, yes indeed. I am perfectly... in my in my mobile only. I am not in. You are perfectly audible. Right. Okay. Now, first of all, we should try to locate the issue to which area of ethics or philosophy does it belong. We should be clear. Uh, we should have a clear distinction between normative ethics and meta-normative ethics. Normative ethics, normative ethics were concerned with the different norms and how uh, the moral judgment uh, becomes possible. But the meta-normative ethics is a step away from this, beyond it, which seeks to examine the seminal concepts or the fundamental or the foundational concepts and issues in ethics. So it examines, as the name implies, it examines the concepts and issues in normative ethics. 
that is how it is a step uh, uh, you can say beyond or you can say step away from normative ethics you see philosophical discussions uh, are indicative of different layers of transcendence philosophy is a secondary discipline because a philosopher disengages himself from engagement with the facts and try to understand frameworks, the concepts by which facts are understood in different empirical or first order disciplines. If a first order discipline makes use of the concept of hypothesis, it is philosopher tries to examine the logic of a hypothesis. That is how philosophers, philosophy is said to be a second order discipline. Neither saying that philosophy is superior, nor saying that empirical sciences are inferior, but simply stating the facts, stating certain facts about the nature of philosophical reflection. It is a meta act. You see, when we live our life, this is a faster engagement. But when you reflect on the nature of life, purpose of life, understand life, and try to you know, discuss different issues pertaining to life situations, we are entering into the domain of philosophy. So, all that I have been trying to tell, uh, share with you is this, which all of you are of course conversant being students of philosophy, that, meta, that there are different layers of transcendence. When a philosopher tries to reflect on, on, on certain concepts, employed in faster disciplines, he is trying to disengage himself from herself from empirical mode and trying to understand the concept. Because on, if, her, if there is a model headedness in, with regard to concepts, your empirical inquiry is likely to be adversely affected. So, conceptual clarity is a prerequisite even for success in empirical investigations. That is as simple as that. Now, is, ought, and can, these, uh, they, uh, they are, uh, the, you know, they, they fall within the ambit of within the scope of meta-normative ethics. What is the concept of is, ought and can, how could, what is the interface, semantic interface, logical interface among the three basic concepts. Now, you know that is, ought dichotomy primarily is, you know, significative of the fact value distinction in common value. We normally distinguish between what is the case and what ought to be the case. That introduces us also a certain ethical phenomenon like what we desire and what is desirable. What one desires or tends to seek to have or desire may not be what is desirable. Maybe that I being, uh, being an alcoholic, I tend to take alcohol, even though it is not desirable for me in view of my failing health. I may feel like taking sweets, but the fact that I am a diabetic, taking sweets may aggravate my, my suit of my sugar. So, it is, so do, even though I desire sweets, it is not desirable. So, desiring is a fact. And being desirable or undesirable is a valuation, is a valuation. So the very act of valuing takes us beyond the facticity of a situation. I do something and then I judge whether what I have done is right or wrong, there are two different activities. When I say I need this, I desire this, it's a fact. But when I try to judge it against a norm, that's a value, that's a valuation, act of valuation. But all valuations are, we should remember that all valuations are not moral valuations. If I say the weather is good, it's a valuation. If I say it is cloudy, the weather is inclement, the weather is cloudy, it is a chilly weather, climate, or it's a cold climate. Maybe somebody said it's not good because I am susceptible to cold. Somebody says it's good because I am, it is good for sadhana meditative practices. 
So maybe the weather may be good for some purposes, it may not be good for some other purposes, depending on the purposes at hand or context at hand. So the first distinction between fact and value is this, about the fact there is little scope for disagreement. That the sky is cloudy is a fact. Even if a blind man cannot see the clouds hovering in the sky, but you can see the after effect of the cloud, it is relatively cool. Two years, two hours back, it was hot. So you feel such a textual perception of and makes an inference the sky is cloudy. Because it doesn't feel the scorching rays of the sun. That the sky is cloudy, is covered with clouds, overcast with clouds, is a fact. There is hardly any disagreement. So there is an intersubjective consensus about facts. So it is said fact is objective, fact is impersonal, fact is not something which is not created by us, fact is something which is out there, fact is something which is to be discovered, fact is something which is known when we are in conformity with the state of, states of affairs. The realist would say. So this is the nature of fact, objectivity. It's an impersonal, fact is impersonal, it's subjective, it's not subjective. It's not cloudy for me, for you, for a blind man or for a, it's a, it's a cloudy, it's a cloud, it's a fact, there's no disagreement. Either earth moves around the sun or the sun moves around the sun, both of them cannot be facts. In, in sciences, there cannot be two contradictory theories. At different points of time, of course, at one point of them geocentric, then you add heliocentric. At one point, but at the same time, both cannot be true. Either earth moves around the sun or sun moves. So, fact is stands for objectivity, pure objectivity. But with regard to, I'm trying, we are trying to come to grips with what is the basic distinction between fact and value, or is and ought. Now, in case of value judgments, in case of moral valuations, there is a scope for disagreement. You say, you know, if I say that uh, a student, uh, my teacher is good, another says that he is not good. If he says he is good, he says that he is good for the, because of it comes in time and teaches well, comes prepared. The other one says that yes, he is a teacher, he's a, but he doesn't care. The other says that he doesn't care whether to what extent he is intelligible. His teachings fly over the head of many people. So he's not good. Same person, same teacher may be good for some students and may not be good for some students. So there is a possibility, there is a room for disagreement with regard to a moral judgment. But it is not so in case of a factual judgment. Because in moral judgment, what is important is the standard of standard that you are appealing to, norms you are appealing to. An action may be good for a hedonist and may not be good for a rigorist. Because they have different criterion of goodness. Some try to judge an action to be good depending on the nature of the action, deontologies, and some on the consequences, consequences, and some on the intention of the agent, the virtue you know, the proponents of virtue ethics. So friends, there is a, always a room for, a elbow room for, or a room for, scope for, you can say justification for disagreement. So with regard to same fact, same, supposing knife is good, you say knife is good, you see, every moral judgment is a reason judgment. If you know it is not subjective, saying that there is room for uh, subjective difference with regard to moral judgment does not mean that moral judgments are subjective. They are not out and out attitudinal. Because if you say the weather is good, you have to say why it is good. It is always pertinent to ask why it is good. If you say knife is good, you must say why it is good. So every moral judgment comes with a why. The knife is good probably because it is handy, because 
it is shining, now it is portable, and it is a sharp edge. But the same knife may not be good for a surgeon because who needs a sharper edge. The knife which is good for a housewife to cut process vegetables may not be good for a surgeon who needs a sharper and still more, you know, you know, a micro knife, which is useful for the for surgery, for operating an ulcer. So there is a scope for disagreement, subjective disagreement. Doesn't mean that it's subjective because every judgment, oral judgment comes with a why. And why is a demand for reason. You say that why it is not good, a doctor would say that these are the umpteen reasons for which this knife is not good for me. The same knife may not be sharp enough for a dakai who wants to slit the throat. You know, a good knife for you may not serve his purpose, good or bad. So we should not say that moral judgments are subjective simply because there is disagreement. I don't say that because it is, it, it is, it is not good or it is bad, an action is bad, simply because I don't like it. You must say, why you don't like it? Why? This why is a demand for reason, demand for a rational. And this fact value diagram. Now the question is, the crux of the issue is, how are they related? Are moral, moral facts or moral valuations diverse from facticity or what is the, what the world is like? No. It's an empathic no. Because moral judgments are not given in a vacuum. It is given in a particular existential situation in case of voluntary action of an individual. So it is a it has its owes its significance to an existential situation. There is no moral judgment which is valid universally, irrespective of the context and circumstances, time and climate. Moral judgments are always context specific. A society where the girls outnumber the males, polygamy may be a moral action, moral imperative to balance the ratio. Society, the, we are going high, adding society with the large number of infant, female infanticide. A time may come when the girls are less and male out, uh, males outnumber, far outnumber the females. In that case, polyandry will be an ethical mandate. A girl marrying more than one husband. So how to balance? So whether polyandry or polygamy, it will depend on what is the nature and structure and the state of affairs in the society. That, that way, a moral judgment always presupposes a fact. And moreover, as it was suggested, you see moral imperatives are to be practiced. Hypothetically, if there is a moral injunction, moral imperative, which can never be practiced by anyone, it cannot be moral injunction. Because moral imperatives are meant to be practiced. In other words, an ethical principle or a norm ceases to be significant or turns out to be vacuous if it does, cannot have any actual or a possible application in a situation. That's it. So moral principles have to be practiced and the practice in a situation with a reference to an individual, a person. So, the moral valuations presuppose a certain fact. It is, it is the facts which constitute the basis for moral valuation. The facts, the circumstances being changed, the moral valuation will also change. It's not difficult to figure it out, how it functions. Because the moral judgment is given in a situation, in an existential situation, in an existential axis. Violence is bad. But there are occasions when violence is justified. If you are, if you are, if you are, you know, the minimal violence or minimal action that you can take to defend yourself 
your life, your property, your dignity. Many, many people may say it is justified. An animal, a roving animal, which is made a very is badly bruised, is in a made an accident, made an accident. Whether mercy killing is desirable or not, killing for food, killing an animal for food, but killing an animal to save when the possibility of survival of that animal is not there, is remote, badly bruised in accident. So this killing is prompted by your love your concern for the suffering animal. So when the situation changes, the same action may be good or bad. So it is the circumstances, it is the context, it is the situational contingencies which determine the ethical merit of an action. How can you say that facts are absolutely diverse from, values are diverse from facts? Untenable the position. Because we have to remember that moral judgments are always given with a reference on individual or action of an individual or community or a group in a particular situation. So that way they are relative and context specific. So that goes to show that every moral valuation has its anchorage, has to have its root or you know basis in certain facts. As you give the example of a polygamy being an or polyandry, marrying more than one wife, marrying more than one husband depends on the structure of the society. So that that societal contingency, that situational relativity, relativism determines whether a moral injunction, a particular moral imperative, is tenable or not, is sound or not, acceptable or not valid or not, livable or not, that's it. Now going to the other part of the issue, if fact means pure objectivity, let, let us do, do a little bit of analysis of the concept of factuality or facticity. What is it? It means something is out there irrespective of the observers. The sky is cloudy, it is cloudy for every one of us. So there is no, in a situation, there is a fact, there is an observer. Objectivity means the fact remains immune or you can immune to the influence of the observer. Observer is a non-participant. It has been rightly said that when a scientist goes to the laboratory, he wants to only observe, he doesn't want to participate. If you participate, then it is no more objective. You are imputing your subjective motivations or the, you know, the, the, there is an intervention of the framework. And all. So the objective means observing something, the virgin fact, the brute fact, or the pure fact or mere fact, without your inter participation the observer. That if that is the objectivity in, as pure and simple, there is no objectivity as such. Objectivity becomes a myth. No objectivity. The so-called objectivity is not there if you think that you observe without the participation of an of a observer. Why? Because there can be no observation without a framework, without the interpretation. Whenever you say that it's a fact, it is this. Already you have imputed on our words, certain values, certain values into it. So in this sense, fact is not value, even if fact is not value neutral, because even an act of bare observation or mere observation is tempered by certain values. Let me take the example. <clears throat> Suppose you see a flower, you say it's a flower, how to look at it? The way a poet looks at it as a marvelous creation of the leaf, invokes, evokes, sorry, it evokes <coughs> feeling of divinity. 
When a woman looks at it, maybe she wants to put it on, on her plate as an object for decorating her plate. And when a person who has a perfume factory looks at it, he thinks of the, you know, the, 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 the way it can be used to prepare a good scent, let's say. When a botanist looks at it, how does he look at it? What is it? Is it the same flower for a gardener who wants to make garlands and sell it and give it to the Lord? Same flower for a botanist who wants to see the constituents of it. Same flower for a poet. Same flower for a woman. Is it the same sea for the newlyweds and a old man who has gone to recuperate his health? No. And a fisherman. The same sea. The fisherman, the, 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 the child is born and brought up there. For him the sea is different. And for a newlyweds the sea is different. And for a old man, it's different. Is it the same reality for everyone? Certainly not. You know, in the King Shakespeare said, we are to gods as flies are to the wanton boys. They kill us for their sport. It is not the same butterfly. For a child, we pins it, and the more it wriggles in pain, the happier he is. It is not the same butterfly for a geologist, and same butterfly for a nature lover. What is it? It is not the same Konark temple for a Marxist who looks at, who sees the blood, sweat, toil and tears of 1200 artisans for 12 years, bonded lover, exploitation, symbol of exploitation. Someone looks at it as a divinity because it was built to worship sun god. And someone else looks at a piece of marvelous architecture, a mute witness to the, the excellence and superb, you know, uh, you know, skill of the audition artisans. What is it then? So the, the way we, the, the moment we view something, say it is this, it has, by this we betray our own values. Now tell me if sun is, the moon is round, objective or not, we tell our children, we see the moon is round, but is it objective? Is the moon round for one who is landing on moon? All full of mountains. But it is objective for, from the view of, from the point of view of the onlookers of earth. From earth it looks round, but it is relative to the, the position in the cosmos. If two planes are going in this, with the same speed, it appears as if not only you are, they both are static. So in this sense, there is no pure objectivity. By pure objective, mean there is no participation of observer. There is no objective at all. There is no factual at, at all. There, uh, some values have, you know, they go to influence, intervene your perception. Panir Silvam ji, Srikal ji, am I making some sense to our parents? friends? Of I course. Making all sense. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Brother Varnish is also there because I want to get myself corrected. And because there's no point in saying something which you waste unless until it is intelligible and it is uh, academically paying to uh, the people who are. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> moon is round, though it apparently objective. There is element of relativism in it. So, pure objective. I, I'll, I'll just end up this part of the discussion by putting, uh, you know, a practicing scientist, which is oft quoted. The scientist says, when I go to the laboratory, I, I go with the promise, with the commitment of a non-participating observer. I want to only observe, I don't want to participate. Because if I participate, I disturb the objective observation. When a scientist enters in the laboratory, goes with the promise of an non-participating observer underline this but when it comes out it comes out uh, with the conviction that i was a non-observing participant 
I hold the while I participated, the interpretation, the concept, my framework of interpretation, the, 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 the space time the relationship. So he comes out as a non observing participant. He goes as a non participating observer, only observe, observe, don't participate. But he comes out as a non observing participant. That is how pure objectivity, the notion and the concept of pure objectivity is a myth or a misnomer. But in common parlance, make a distinction between facts and values. Fact referring to what is the case, we agree that it's a fact, and values. Valuation consists in weighing them against a norm, an axiom. The first point is, all conclusions are somehow parasitic, contingent upon actuality. But that does not mean that odd conclusions are purely subjective because there is always a reason. Every moral judgment is a reason statement. On the other hand, pure objectivity is also made because some element of interpretation, valuation, subjectivism goes into our perception of so-called facts. So the objectivity is infected with subjectivity. If you take objectivity in the absolute sense of the term, nonetheless, the distinction between fact and value remains sacrosanct, remains meaningful, valid, intelligible in common parallels. Fact it, what is the case, and valuation is what, what ought to be the case. Next, next, let's go to the next part of it. Now, when you, when you value an action, see, this is something which I need not tell you, because moral valuations are meaningful only in human domain. If an animal enters into the kitchen and takes the food, you blame your wife, not the animal. You don't say it is a moral dog which has encroached on my kitchen. If a child takes a lamb and sets house, house on fire, you don't blame the child, you give the mother because you are careless in giving that. Because in a child, the, the notion of right and wrong is not yet grown. And if you take given knife to all a insane, it goes on a killing spree, you don't blame a insane for killing people, you take, don't take him to the gallows. He doesn't attract the provisions of law, but he goes to a lunatic asylum. In one, the rationality has not yet grown. In other, it is already impaired. So, moral judgments are given in respect of actions, voluntary actions, actions done with a sense of purpose, actions which are consciously done, actions which enjoy the choice of a moral agent. Now, the question is. If every one of us are rational at the core, which can't would underline, we are all rational at the core, and uh, we have a sense of, uh, you know, to add to that, we are not only rational at the core, but we are all moral at the core. Morality is innate. That is something which you have to acknowledge. Even the dreaded criminal knows heart of heart what he is doing is not good. A pickpocket knows that picking the pocket is bad because he, if he is pickpocketed, then he won't swear the pickpocket. Why? Because you have become amassed fortunes by pickpocketing. Why you mind or you object that somebody one else picks your pocket? So, irrespective of what you do, the sense of morality is also innate. We know it is good at not. I always give this example, if you go to a North Hills and see how the head man is settling disputes, the way he is marshalling arguments, the way he is invoking ethical conduct and moral codes, shows that he is, because he is not, he, he has not been schooled in ethics. How does he get that ethical sense? It means that morality is in it. Now, the, despite that, if rationality is universal present to everyone, everyone is potentially rational, and morality is there, and uh, what is rationality is a discriminative faculty, right and wrong. Now, why there is a disagreement? Now, as I already indicated, moral judgments are always a norm specific, something is good because it is confirmed with the norm. Now, if there are variety of norms, then there will be variety of value paradigms. That could be consequences, consequential limit, deontology, virtue ethics, and so on and so forth. So whenever I am packing, passing a moral judgment with my friends agree, they agree because they subscribe to the same norm. 
why there are varieties of norms how norms get their meaning every norm gets its meaning or rational from a world view i'll give an example a person who subscribes to the world view or ontology isavasya vidam sarvam upanishadic ontology for him sacrifice becomes a value tena tektana enjoy through sacrifice is a position the first look the first part is an ontology the second part is the ethical corollary is always everything is part by the lord <coughs> we are part of a cosmic family therefore the ideal of enjoyment the ideal enjoyment consists in sharing and caring for others take another world view charvak pasmi bhutasya dehasya punaragamanam kuta are where does the life man goes after death life comes to an end with death begins with birth physical birth if that is the life at your disposal then what is the ethics jabat jibeng sukham jibe drunam krutva you see maximize your pleasure doesn't matter so for them pushpin as good as poetry as bentham said so with the difference of ontology different ethical paradigms crop up so in other words it's a world view ontology which lends rational to a norm and norm lends rational to a moral valuation that is how there is a three tier system Naxon is good because it comes with norms. It is a ethical norm because it is in keeping with world view. So here again, a metaphysical fact determines moral valuation. That is why you will see that a moral valuation has factuality in the background, also in the foreground. On the foreground. So, if moral value, if you analyze the logic of a moral judgment, then you will feel you feel that this is relevant with the reference to the situation, the context, the contingencies at hand. Number two is this is said to be good because it is conformity with a norm. The norm is a norm becomes an ethical norm, which is rational to an ontology or metaphysics of the world. That's it. Now, the next issue is if. This is the relationship between is and ought. Now the next issue is why? What is it? This is also issue in matter normative ethics. Why is it a ethical norm? What makes what makes it entitled to be an ethical norm? Because there is an implicit presumption, implicitly subscribed to a particular ontology that is in your framework. This is good, and another framework that, that uh, you know. That may not be. If it is, it is now you see, this is not expediency. This is conformity to certain standards, norms, norms in conformity with the world views. Now, when there is a conflict of paradigms, conflict of ontologies, how it is to be resolved? Whether Charvak ontology is right, maintainable. tenable or upper the metaphysics here comes the pragmatics try with this materialistic ontology the society will crumble like house of cards it will result in gross individualism and ethics will be casualty to so to so, so, so that is why there is a built in contradiction if you take out the ontology and elaborate it i have elaborations corollaries of existence corollaries they will be anomalous internally incoherent they will die by thousand qualifications but here is a paradigm the ethics of renunciation there are two different paradigms ethics of acquisition and ethics of renunciation one says that the more pleasure you have the happier you are the more rewarding is life the other says the more you share and care the more fulfilling it is ethics of acquisitive ethics and ethics of renunciation the vedantic ontology constitutes the bedrock of bed, 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 rock bed of or a bedrock of a holistic ethics and envisions a society a universal cosmic society where not only human beings but also plants and animals are members which peer sarkar of course is a 
as in from new humanism so vedantic ethics is not humanistic but is new humanistic because it brings within its embrace the flora fauna even even the so called inanimate objects there is nothing like pure matter because matter is nothing but gross form of consciousness it is one primordial consciousness we become matter so matter is a potential consciousness a potential mind there is no antithesis between matter and mind and consciousness rather matter mind and consciousness they are they they they, they exhibit different degrees in which the primordial consciousness expresses itself so every matter as the theosophy said who oh, hidden life vibrant in every atom so everything is potential conscious potential i don't say that it is divine or sacred everything is put as a potential mind and conscious in trees it is less explicit in animals it is more explicit it is man it is most explicit but still man has to go ahead to negotiate the you know to negotiate by negotiating the gap between manhood and godhood that is where we stand friends without an ontology without a metaphysics you see immoral valuations cannot be understood in their native nature native stand native axis now this being the nature of moral valuations now the question is suppose i have the go to the next issue that is suppose i have knowledge of what is good this is a very very tickly issue uh, which has been uh, discussed at length by philosophers both in the east and west why is it that even if i so now we understand what is a moral valuation now moral value suppose i know that some i have knowledge of good does it necessarily mean that i'll be i will practice it does knowledge bring about a natural transition from from paradigm to praxis knowing what is good and doing what is good knowing what is good life and living one's good life is it necessarily the case that you have knowledge, knowledge of ethics as an ethical man as a matter of fact is found that a person who is conversant grounded in ethics may be most immoral in day to day life knowing what is good does it mean that i will do i will do good there are different views now most of indian thinkers in socrates and west they would say knowledge is virtue to know is to be if you know what is good that carries the inner mandate creates a compulsion to be good to do good in other words they would say if somebody is not doing good means he doesn't have knowledge of good because a knowledge of good is enough to propel you to goad you to coerce you to a life of goodness So look at this uh, the philosophical implication of it that means a cognition cognitive art of knowing contains the cognitive art of doing willing doing if i know what is good i cannot but do be do the good be good conversely if i don't do good that means i have somewhere i'm ignorant about what is goodness because it, the that means from action retrospectively you can understand whether a person is ignorant if someone is given to evil he is ignorant some is given to good given to the path of good is knowledge retrospectively prospectively if you know what is good you are doing going to do good if you are ignorant you will fall short of the moral expectations you will do evil that means the transition from knowledge to praxis is natural provided you know you are you really know understand what is good so what is the, the what is a person knows what is good he cannot but be good this is also sounded by hair arm hair he says that moral imperative is action guiding in nature if i say that i know i this good i may not do it is a contradiction because knowing good also implies the psychological compulsion to do good when circumstances are favorable if i say that i know it is good i may not do it is a contradiction logical and psychological contradiction here calls it because by knowing what is good there is a participation of the cognitive agent and the cognitive agent so given the circumstances 
if I am I have the knowledge of good, I will do good. I will tend to do good. If I am physically prevented, that is different. But Plato, Aristotle, and first others, they say it is not necessarily the case. I may know what is good, I may not may have adequate knowledge about what is good, I may not do what is good. This, this predicament, this existential predicament is echoed in the in the Mahabharata, you know, which is oft quoted by Durjodana, Janami Dharmang Nachami Prabhruti. I know what is dharma, what is righteousness, but I don't have inclination, I don't have disposition, I don't have the inner motivation to do it, I don't do it. I did not do it in my life. It's a fundamental question we asked to Drona is Gurudev, why it is so with me and why it is different with Yudhisthira? We are tutored in the same class. Both of us had, were given adequate knowledge about what is dharma, what is adharma, but I know what is adharma, but what is dharma, I don't have prabhruti. And I know Janami Adharmangana Chamani Bruti. I know what is Adharma, but I don't have, I cannot restrain myself. I cannot abstain myself. I cannot desist myself. I cannot keep myself away from what is bad. Knowing pretty well that is bad. This Aristotle calls moral weakness Akrasya. I may know what is good, but I may not do what is good. I do act to the contrary. This is a fact. But the, 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 those who said the, the, they said knowledge is virtue, they would say that means you don't have sufficient knowledge. If there is no transition from knowledge to practice, that means you don't have adequate knowledge. You have only information. You have only information of what of do's and do what ethics is about. There is no participation of the is it? Participation. So knowledge is also participatory in nature. That is their framework. Now they would say that it is a fact that oh, somebody may know what is right, what is wrong, which is right and wrong, but one may not do what is right and cannot prevent oneself from, from not doing what is wrong. It's a perennial moral dilemma of a moralist. How to understand it? Now Plato would look at it like this, he said that so long as your, you know, your knowledge is always rationally grounded. If your rational motivations or your will is weak, weakness of will. It is not enough that you know what is good, you must have a strength of will to translate into action. If you don't have that strength of will, why you don't have a strength of will? Because the will is taken for a ride by the non-rational factors. Your instincts, your emotions, your attachments, your passions. So the emotions, attachments and you know, take you for a ride, may take you for a ride. That is why even if you know what is good, it is not going to have, not carry sufficient motivation or incentive or compulsion. Or a guiding mandate to what, do what is good. Because even though you know what is good, that quantity, that will, you don't have the strength of will. It's called accuracy. Why? Because often, you know, our rationality is taken for a ride by the non rational factors emotions, sentiments, passions, angularities, eccentricities. Moments of self-indulgence. Now, Davidson looks at it differently. He said it is a failure of every... He said that reason is a cause of action. You do it because you have a reason to do it. But sometimes non rational same thing, you could in a different way. Non-rationality can also cause your action. When action is caused by non-rationality, you cease to be moral. It's a failure of reason. You act against the better judgment, judgment of your better self or better judgment of yourself. It's, it's a fact. Plato would say that the rational, there are three type parts, parts of the rational, appetitive and the spiritative. He said, ideally, it is rational self which should dominate, should regulate. If it doesn't so happen, 
then there is a that is a weak a weakness of the will and you fail to do what you what you even if you know what is good knowledge is necessary not a sufficient condition for moral action knowledge of morality is a, is a necessary is a, is, a, is a necessary condition not a sufficient only knowledge will not do that is why he makes a distinction between knowledge as potentiality and knowledge at actuality every person who knows what is good has the prospect or he has the potentiality to do what is good but that is not enough unless you have requisite strength of will strength of reason reason should override non rational factors if it doesn't happen so it happens to the contrary you act differently it is wrong you can't prevent it it is right you can't it is not it, it, you, you, you may not do it that is the predicament of many of the lesser mortals now how do you strengthen the reason has that built in strength to overcome non strength that is another promise of a moral agent the reason is not need not is that doesn't you know if you allow reason to play itself into the hands of the non natural factors you become a victim of your weaknesses frailties there is a rationality has that potentiality to overcome the non rational motivation factors so every moral agent has the capacity the potentiality to win over the evil spell baneful influence of the lower propensities the pull and push of instincts emotions passions vagaries of ideas fond beliefs dogmas superstitions you go wrong because they take you fall a prey to them you lend yourself to be to their in the clutch or you can the evil spell for that you are responsible because every moral agent has that potentiality to overcome the limiting influence of non rational factors and act rationally and moral action is a rational action moral judgment is rational as i told you that for every moral judgment you can always ask why it is good there are other passages the others they say that knowledge moral judgment presupposes knowledge knowledge this is socratic tradition knowledge is grounded in rationality and rationality is a overriding has a can play overriding role against non rational factors so a person who is faith, who, who, who gives prioritizes rationality over non rational factors he cannot but be good he cannot be an acratic agent so this and uh, and 10 minutes i would like to spend with the permission that this is is and ought and why there is a fail. now ought and can this is uh, something we hinted at in course of discussion this is very interesting linkage ought is necessarily linked with can can is an ability expression ability i guess i can yes we can a thing which i cannot i ought not the other way a handicapped child doesn't have any moral obligation to serve the parents when he grows because of congenital defect he has a congenital defect so he doesn't have a duty for anyone else but others have a duty for him to nurture him as long as he is alive it becomes their moral compulsion bound an obligation for that a child does ought not because he cannot so the can again presupposes the ability of the moral agent to trust if i cannot do something it cannot be a moral imperative for me to do it okay so this that means on the one hand morality is is parasitic on facts 
it is facts which determine the nature of valuation values evaluation on the other hand the what is right and wrong will depend on the built in capacity or inherent ability of the person to translate it otherwise it remain, remains as a moral dictum mere moral knowledge devoid of any content because i know it is good sorry i cannot do it i cannot do it therefore it cannot be my duty it cannot be my duty a person who is in security who is there at the you know gate to ensure that outside don't come cannot be responsible for indiscipline in the class for which teacher may be responsible because he doesn't have that duty because he cannot if he is attending to his duties at the gate he cannot see the discipline in the class so somewhere the notion of ability or ability to translate the you know imperative and moral imperative in action is built into the concept of morality so the so the, this is how the can the is on the one hand at the background and can constitute the foreground both are fact, facts that i cannot do it is a fact it is a personal fact could be a social fact could be situationality the fact that determine whether it is a valid moral imperative or not on the other hand the background it is a facts which play there is an intimate interplay or interface between facts and values because values are not moral judgments are not given in a vacuum they are given with reference to a particular situation existence of situation with the issues at hand the moral prescriptions in a given society may, not, may turn out to be irrelevant in a society and one more thing i would like to share with your friends do the norms are ontology specific do the moral valuations are come context specific the values which makes a moral a ethical norm an ethical norm is not context is absolute this is another part of another you know dimension of morality what is good in a particular community may not be good in another community but the reason why something is good in this community and something is good in that community is the same that means the fundamental values are different from customary values the customary values are contingent customary values are community dependent customary values are contingent because they assume their significance from social situations they are relative from they are change from context to context could be but the reason why they are values i i'll, I'll just try to substance it the reason why they are values is same example i give the example of marrying more than one wife marrying more than one husband on the part of women a polyandry may be meaningful in one community where the males outnumber far outnumber the females and polygamy may be a moral mandate ethical mandate or an imperative or a social mandate enjoying the consensus the legal legality you know legal sanctions in a society where women outnumber the men how to effect a social balance harmony males have to make marriage and polygamy will be a, a, a social and when the change of structure of society this will polygamy will cease to be polyandry will cease to be an offense marrying more than one wife will be forbidden by a constitution for the ratio is 9 to 10 but the reason why polyandry is good in that community and polygamy is good in this community is same because they promote both the, promote social harmony social good so the notion of good social good or collective good somehow is built into the notion of 
ethical norm. Ethical norm is an ethical norm simply because it, it pro proves to be expedient for social good, collective good. Which in a very large sense is said to be Loka Sangra in Bhagavad Gita. Even committing genocide, killing hundreds of Kauravas, is said to be Dharma Juddha because the intention is good. The intention is good. If the friend's action has three parts. One is the agent with its action, intention, purpose, the action itself, and the consequence. The consequences say that an action is good if the consequence is good. Now the deontologists say an action is good for its own sake, irrespective of consequences, if it is rationally tempered. Can't. And virtue ethics would say that an action is good if the agent intention is good. Depending on that are the three paradigms. Virtue ethics, deontology and consequentialism. Depending on what you take into account while determining the goodness of an action. The moral merit or ethical merit of an action. So, If intention is taken into account, doesn't matter what you do. You might be distributing our politician, you must be distributing blankets now because the election is in the offing. You are distributing blankets. By your blankets, the poor people ward off their cold. <laughs> but you can't say, we can't say that's a good action, moral action, because the intention is to who votes. By giving blankets, you are trying to win their favor. So it is the intention which ultimately de determines and this is where Kant's notion of universal liability stands paramount, stands significant. How to know what is good, what is bad? Ask yourself, can I wish everyone to do it? Why? Speaking truth is good because I can wish everyone to speak the truth. Telling lies is bad because I cannot wish everyone to tell lies. I cannot, if I tell a lie, I take advantage of my wife. I cannot wish that my wife should tell a lie. Also lie me. My servant should lie me. So I cannot wish it to be a universal principle because the presumption in Kant is that where everyone is equal at, at some point, we are all wrestled at the core. If something is good, it is good irrespective of persons and circumstances. Rigorous. If fighting against evil is is good, then doesn't matter what is the means. Of course, there are three other means, Ramadana, Danda, Veda. You know, Danda was the last resort which he followed because all other three methods failed. So that was the confrontation with the Kauravas and ending them. Even though it amounted to genocide, kind of genocide. And Arjun was reluctant to do that because of the dreadful aftermath of genocide. But Lord Krishna persuaded him to take up arms. And he ends at the Bhagavad Gita, yes, I will take that name. He is convinced that yes, that means a large scale violence may be justified, provided it is a only way to promote dharma or greater social harmony. So the notion of goodness is built in the concept of fundamental values which constitute the secular core of the sacred. Values like love, forgiveness. Love generates forgiveness, tolerance, mutuality, service, sense of identification, empathy, sympathy. Living for one another, sharing with one another. These constitute the fundamental values which lend rational to different ethical norms. Ethical customary values get their meaning from fundamental values, otherwise cease to be values at all. Values per se, at all. So it is the fundamental values, the universal values, the foundational values, the basic values, which are secular in nature. They cut across different religious denominations, friends. Take away these values from Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, the religions crumble like house of cards. They turn out to be mere rituals, benefiting neither the individual nor the society nor the followers. So every sacred de denomination has, has to have its base, has to derive its rational justification from the way they try to help the followers to imbibe the values, to cultivate the values 
in the individual and collective life. So, in the, there are hierarchy of values at the rock bottom lie, the universal values. And the universal values are not space-time contingent. They are meaningful, they are relevant, they are always of contemporary relevance. Because they have, why? Because they have the survival value. Unless you love and serve, unless you sacrifice and forgive, society will not, society is not a simple mere togetherness of individuals. Sangha cha dhvang, sangha vada dhvang. This is, this strikes a keynote of society. Society is not one where people simply come together. Globalize in the physical plane. There has to be globalize in the psychic plane, friends. I must treat everyone else as my neighbor. I must prioritize the needs of others over my needs. This part of it, I could not discuss, of course. What is the nature of moral living? How is morality born? Morality is always other-centric. It is said, he only lives who lives for others. This is how a morality is. This is what moral behavior is about. This is how the moral life is led. As long as you think that everyone is a means to my, I am the end, morality becomes a casualty. The moment I think that he, the other is the end, I live for himself, for, for the other, morality matures. Morality matures there when I live for the other. If everyone lives for one another in society, then there will be heaven and earth, friends. And if you ignore the message, you are bound to end up in the global crisis. Now we are in a global crisis with two exclusive choices. Either we live together and die together. Why things have come to such a pass? Because we have ignored values. We have given priority to development without values. We have given priority to civilization without culture. Culture is value centric without culture. Civilization will die like house of, you know, like will meet its waterloo. Somewhere we have, you know, we have forgotten to integrate values to technology. We need a technology with a human face. Because the same nuclear power which can destroy civilizations can also give illumination to every village. The same knife in the hands of a mother, housewife, which processes vegetables, in the hands of a dakayat, it can cut throat. So, technology is a mere power. Science is a mere power, blind with, in purposes, reaching mechanisms are blind in purposes. So, we need science and technology, the human face. That is possible when values are integrated into it. Values cannot be added of extra. It has to grow from within. It has to be built in the system of our technology and science, technology, education, everything. So it has to be integrated in the system so that anyone who passes through it on awareness becomes not only efficient but also value centric. What we need today is a generation of efficient people. Not only that, good people, righteous people so that they don't abuse their efficiency but use their efficiency for the good for the collective good, because in collective good is addressed, individual good is automatically addressed. Bhagavad Gita or Indian ethics doesn't see any incompatibility between individual good and collective good, because collective good, when it is addressed, individual good is taken care of, friends. So that is why it is time, in view of the imminent crisis, or crisis are already in, we have to wake up to the messages of the great masters, message of the great scriptures, which tell us in one voice that if you want to live, you have to opt for a global living. You have to opt for the ethics of live and let live. Thank you. I think I have taken more time than I should have taken. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. I don't know whether it made sense. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shimi, please conduct the uh, proceeding. Yes. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful talk. It's been really a thought provoking, really nice. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, now I invite Professor Sri Glenn Nair, our patron. And ma'am, could you please uh, give the comments and uh, initiate the interaction? Oh, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Mohanty. It was indeed wonderful, wonderful. Actually, ethics is, uh, I'm a professional epistemologist, and uh, ethics is not my cup of tea, but then. I rejoiced hearing you. And uh, uh, particularly one private joy is that uh, you have declared, I thought that I'm the one who proposes this thesis, but I heard you also saying that ethics is a derivation from 
ontology metaphysics indeed i i totally subscribe to you uh, so uh, i i see professor paneer selvam uh, here uh, i'll come come to you sir very soon but let me quickly wrap up what uh, uh, professor mohante has uh, said he started with the nature of philosophizing as a second order uh, discipline in uh, distinguished between what is desired and what is desirable and slowly guide us holding our hand slowly guide us uh, to the field of evaluation and he spoke about different types of valuation all valuations are in moral valuations and then he spoke about the moral valuation the nature of moral judgments as a uh, not being purely subjective as branded by the positivists gone are those days today you now we no more think that uh, moral judgments are private and uh, therefore um, um untamable for philosophical analysis and then he took us to the popular fact value uh, divide the notorious i must say uh, the fact value uh, divide and he beautifully told us how this divide can be erased off uh, by pointing in both ways like how fact to factors being value laden and how value is fact fact oriented in both ways uh, we ought to or we necessarily uh, we are prompted to erase off this uh, uh, so called uh, divide between a fact and a value and then he moved on to how the ethical judgments are placed on the norms and that is why we call it as a normative discipline right or logic ethics aesthetics all are normative disciplines so now but then quickly i mean i, I don't know i i haven't heard anyone saying this other than uh, professor uh, mehanti and hats off uh, to you um, for you know making things visible to the young community here that this norm the norms or the ethical norms are footed on the world view the ontology as such you know that makes things uh, visible ethics do not come from nowhere it has an ontology to uh, support so the three tier st structure the ethical judgments the norm being supported that and the norm further being um footed on the world view or the uh, ontology and then he told us how uh, the ethical judgments are different from ontological judgments how ontology being i mean uh, taken to the world of uh, praxis and then he spoke about uh, uh, quickly but that part of course i will have to discuss with him uh, he you know uh, Uh, I mean, we were a bit surprised when he moved to consciousness, and then he spoke about the identity between consciousness and matter. Mm, and uh, then uh, he spoke about, uh, uh, and then he also spoke a lot on Indian philosophy, uh, which again was a pleasure to uh, listen, where he spoke about the first mantra of Vishavasya, as well as a lot from. Though he did not speak much on Swadharma. probably we can ask him now uh, but he we heard a lot of bhagavad gita and he quoted uh, duryodhana where he says janami dharmam na chami pravrtihi janami adharmam na na chami nivrti i know that this is all adharma but i i i, I cannot help but uh, doing uh, uh, that and then the ending was also marvelous where right? you spoke about the development <coughs> and how we disconnect our concepts of development from uh, the uh, from its uh, value and how it is very very essential i strongly subscribe to the view that in all planning there should be a philosopher who tells us uh, what should be the plan for development what is good for us uh, all that uh, technology tells us need it as such be applied because we need to have an value orientation so thank you very much professor uh, mahande he has talked much more than what i have some dip uh, but um, i shouldn't be taking too much of time once again thank you very much over to professor paneer selva uh, can we can you please initiate the discussion uh <clears throat> 
थैंक यू वेरी मच प्रोफेसर आदित्य जी हेलो डू हियर मी आदित्य जी वेरी वेल वेरी वेल आदित्य जी थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर एक्सेलेंट एक्सपोजिशन ऑफ ईस एंड ऑट uh in fact a very uh, beautiful distinction between normative and uh, meta normative ethics uh, uh you have done in the beginning and also the distinction we have very clear cut distinction you made between fact and value by saying fact is what one desires whereas the value is what is desirable and another uh, fascinating thing which i like to in your lecture is the distinction you made uh, between these two by saying that fact is a uh, empirical and objective nature whereas uh, you in the case of value you said it is there is a place for disagreement uh and towards the end of course you have uh, uh, leaned uh, on uh, indian philosophical tradition which of course is uh, very much essential uh, but i would like to see the problem from the western standpoint also now uh, Aditya ji, what I want to tell you is, uh, or uh, I would request you to uh, consider uh, my my uh, uh, appeal to you, namely that uh, can't we say that uh, a value judgment is social by nature? Uh, by social, I mean that there is a need for participation of all. There may be disagreement, no doubt. because it is very difficult for us to have uh, absolute agreement among uh, the uh, uh, people but uh, there can be some consensus this is what richard rotty while talking about this distinction says there can be a consensus if most of us agree on something as a value then it has to be accepted as a value so why can't we consider that the entire entire approach towards uh, value uh, can we see this from the social perspective and also uh, you say that it is if i understood you correctly you say that it is contextual it is contextual but to, to some extent only if uh, it is contextual i agree but uh, if you say it is contextual value is contextual then we cannot have a, a universal uh, values the universal for example speaking truth a universal value it can't be contextual and it is for uh, ever uh, from the human species as a, uh, is origin from that time onwards we consider that this as a value and uh, see here uh, in uh, the postmodern tradition we talk about the collapse of uh, the distinction between fact and value the dichotomy has failed now this is what uh, the postmodernists would say i would uh, take two thinkers very briefly one is uh, the american pragmatist uh, uh, richard rotty who has vehemently criticized the approach of uh, uh, the, the i mean the, the scientists for example who consider that something has to be very objective in nature so he rejects that and he says that we should have what is known as uh, the conversational partners which means uh, there should be an agreement among all of us then another uh, important thinker who has uh, emphasized this is uh, habermas in his discourse ethics has shown that uh, in 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 uh, this distinction between is and ought there is always a need for us to practice these values which you are prescribing uh, in fact uh, I, i i somewhere i read uh, um, if i if my memory is right uh, aram har in one place says there is no uh, no point in just keeping this uh, values as values the, the very fact that we are saying that there there are some values it means that has to be practiced so the practical aspect of the value is something which has been stressed by uh, the normative it is like uh, uh, rm har now once again i would like to go back we we'll, i'll like uh, i'll uh, complete it in one minute uh, habermas for example he talks about uh, emancipatory interest it is here he talks about the need for moving from what is and what ought to be now this what ought to be has got lot of implication because it has got uh, uh, a social process that is involved and not only that it says there is a community that is involved there is communication that is involved 
there is life world that is in, involved which means all of us must accept these as uh, values which are very essential and of course i like the way in uh, which uh, you ended your uh, talk by uh, uh, drawing a lot of implication from indian systems especially from bhagavad gita to that text uh, i feel that um, in indian tradition there is also uh, uh, jay krishnamurthy who has been emphasizing the conflict that exists between what is and what to be and he says this is uh, very difficult for a human being to transcend this uh, conflict uh, this uh, i think has to be taken into account while talking about the indian values then i feel that you in your talk you are too much uh, leaning on uh, the deontological ethics especially of kant this has some dangers because when we are uh, in the postmodern world uh, we talk about uh, the failure of deontological ethics why because uh, the in deontological ethics only human being is uh, centered or is a nucleus but we have moved from uh, uh, human being our, our anthropocentric ethics to cosmocentric ethics this is what uh, many uh, modern thinkers like uh, uh jonas young who has pointed out uh, in his well known book the responsibility of ethics the need for transcending this uh, deontological ethics so i think that uh, uh, would help us uh, to transcend the distinction which uh, you made between uh, fact and value this is what i would like to say uh, uh, aditya ji and uh, i very well enjoyed your talk and when i saw that you are uh, giving a talk i, I thought this is my uh privilege to listen to you though i don't have uh, i i am i'm staying outside and i don't have a uh, laptop and all i am using my mobile so i don't know how far i was audible and i was i was uh, visible so i really enjoyed and it's uh, a pleasure to listen to you thank you aditya ji oh ji should, should i respond please okay <clears throat> now <clears throat> i should say in one word that <clears throat> the presence of psychology and to <clears throat> was really greatly inspiring to me because that gives me a that gave a momentum to what i'm because nothing very or <laughs> organizer spoke extempore and i don't know whether it made sense but yes now this you are talking of there are three question main questions and the first two questions are linked participatory emancipatory interest habermas and this now see i just hinted at this that the customary values are contingent they are context specific society specific community specific but the reason why they are norms is that they owe their justification to certain fundamental values like law fellowship because a norm becomes a norm provided it is pro life it promotes life collective good so the customary values have that natural transition to fundamentally universal values which cut across social norms societal norms religious prescriptions so that is precisely the was the what i wanted to really convey that is throw up my talk that in the hierarchy of values there are hierarchy values this goal leads to that goal ultimately there is an apex that they are tapered at one end that is look at the collective good and individual good and collective good are as you saying now participatory interest we should go beyond our selfish interest immediate considerations so that our interest self interest is better satiated in the collective interest so this is how there is a transition from individuality from self centric dispositions uh, peter singer pointed out to cosmocentrism and you are right that those who say the, the 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 those who are saying that the deontology has to be transcended has to be sublimated has to define yes when kant says that we are rational at the core of course there was a illicit presumption that we are rational at the core yes that is true but we being rational at the core we bear the onus or responsibility of taking care of the whole creation just as an able bodied member of a family 
on account of being able bodied or earning more or being privileged and you know better placed he has that moral onus of taking care of the ailing mother and father and children similarly man being the man being most evolved creature having a rational being he bears the onus of taking care of the rest of the creation so that should help him to transcend the selfish interest dispositions and recognize the rest of the creation the rest will not only fellow men that will amount to speciesism because that is where kant you know western philosopher they have their paradigm limitations they cannot so that is if you ex- so deontology is not incompatible with a cosmocentric ethics rather deontology that be rationality is our core that should wake, wake us up that should awaken the universal uh, idea uh, you know sense in us think that yes i being a rational animal cannot think it doesn't have a duty but we have a duty and obligation for nature for in- even inanimate objects even the rivers and mountain they are going to enact laws right of the rivers to flow on hindered right of ocean to remain unpolluted since they have the right to existence we have the duty right of one is the duty of another but but interestingly they don't have duty they have only rights because they are not evolved by the morally blank they don't have are not evolved enough, enough rationally they don't have a discriminating mind so it is man and man alone who has to play the role of a steward on account of being rational so that rationality in presence of rationality as a universal in every human being should make the human community the human you know community of human species to go beyond their anthropocentric interest even a biocentric interest because the anthropocentric this is emancipatory interest the anthropocentric interest and biocentric interest interest of all living beings is best fulfilled in when we address the cosmocentric interest so unless and until we liberate ourselves from the myopic visions ontologically or you know whatever unless and until we uh, liberate us from the confines of our self interest and see that our best interest is best saw, addressed in the when serving the others interest that becomes an emancipatory interest so that is that is as you said that is the natural conclusion doesn't matter in what what banner we talk of that deontology has has to have its fruition only the, when the reason motivates us or goads us to go beyond the rational creatures and recognize the utility intrinsic value of the non rational creatures and play the role of a steward role of a torch bearer role of the head of the family in this on this planet we can't say that human beings are most developed in all planet because my science is yet to discover the and the how, how so understand how big is the universe unless you go beyond the cross go across the universe we have not gone beyond the solar system we can we do not know whether there are more developed than there is a, this this a thesis is now mooted that there are more developed creatures in other parts of the planet or other parts of the cosmos who are more intelligent and uh, you know there is a kind of communication they are trying to figure out they are communicating this is a different issue altogether but human interest is best served values are best addressed only when they are couched on universal values the relative values should awaken us to the universal values which provide a common protesis of collective living that is my submission so you are right that, that that it has to it has to grow you see humanity is growing the collective psyche is getting more and more matured to understand the you know these are uh, the you know the truths enshrined in the scriptures the humanity has to grow psychically and for and the suffering that uh, we are the price we are paying that is only a reminder that is only this these are only process for awakening that we are if we want to survive you have to take hold of the universal values irrespective of distinction man made distinction of caste color you know gender you know racial distinctions the time has come when we should find somewhere we are identical at the core despite our differences with regard to name and form nam and rupa but basically there are same motivation same blood same aspirations it is there with all individuals and not only individuals but all beings so cosmocentrism is the only is the operation of our value consciousness thank you thank you thank you ji thank you for that uh, uh, prashant shukla ji are you here you have uh, uh, yes ma'am yeah please go yes ahead. uh first of all uh, kindly accept my heartfelt thanks sir it was 
very crystal clear and very rare lectures I have attended. So congratulations to you for that, sir. I'm really, really honored to be a part of this. Uh, sir, some of the questions keep coming back to my mind. Uh, since in the very beginning, you made a clear cut distinction between ethics and morality, where it, uh, as I understand that ethics is something which creates theory and morality is something which comes in the form of our behavior. So that is our dichotomy. Now, I have a little bit doubt here that if you we, have, we are discussing it in with context to the Occidental thinkers, then ethics can only be that which is with reference to others. But once you come to the Vedantic position, the Vedantic ontic position, uh, there can be morality or maybe there can be ethical theories irrespective of the other. I mean, the duty towards me of mine should also be considered as the moral judgments, whether they have any impact over the other or not, that's a different issue. Maybe that is the reason why in the third and the fourth ashramas of life, the one trust and the sannyas, the person is still remains moral, though there is nowhere, uh, no one surrounding the individual. Now, in that case, what would happen to this kind of theories? First question and the second and the last one uh, that creates a problem for me. Uh, at one point of time, you said that the moral judgments are founded on the facticity, something like this. Now, my understanding goes that since art implies can, it is not the aspiration which is grounded in the reality. Rather, it is the other way around. So the can is something which is based on our understanding of art. Sir, what would be your response to this? Thank you, sir. OK. Uh, give, me, uh, give me the first question first. Give me the first question. So the One first of... question was that in the Vedantin context, I have to be moral. I, I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, I'm getting get, get, get it. See, there is no cleavage or any hiatus between ethics and morality. Ethics is a systematic study of moral phenomena. Moral phenomena are meaningful in relation to the, the way people behave that way ethics not morality is nothing but living ethicality ethicality when you live ethicality or live ethical norms that become you become a moral person so there is some people say ethics and values some seminars you see this is something redundant uh, you see ethics means values ethics is value centric so ethics and morality, they are not actually different. Rather, they, indi they are indicative of different aspects of the same scenario. So ethics and morality are not different. The, what, the, what, was the, what was your second thing, second thing that you are pointing out? Sir, uh, whether morality should be based on facticity or should it be the other way around? Morality cannot but be based on facticity because you cannot live a moral life in a vacuum. If something is a moral imperative for you, it is an imperative for you in a given situation. The moral imperatives you had when you were a, ch a child is different from the moral imperative when, when you are a responsible officer. So with the change of circumstances, the moral imperatives change. But all moral imperatives derive their meaning from fundamental, certain fundamentals which called universal values or fundamental. And when you live for yourself, you see, yes, there is another part of the question that if we, uh, we can be, morality can be meaningful only when in, in relation to me, myself and my immediate environment. No. You see, the way you live with your immediate environment and family has its bearing on your society around because the individual family is intimately somehow just like a sweater you know fabrics in a sweater if one part is ruptured it weakens the entire part so the problem of one is the problem of everyone even a blade of grass also contributes to the cosmic symphony so the point is somewhere my interest if you you know, enlarge it, expand it, somewhere connected with the interest of every other. So if you are to, if I'm intelligent enough to secure my interest, I should try to see the linkage between my interest and my interest of my, in my, my never and interest of the society at large, because I'm a never to my never and I'm a member of the society. 
So as you as you keep your antennas open, you find that your know, individual interest is intimately bound up with social interest. About that Banaprastha. You see, Banaprastha is one who has relatively discharged his duties as a householder, has has paid back different earners. Devaruna, Pitruna, Matruna, all these have done. Since there are people to take over, so he relatively takes a takes to opt for a life of chintan, seclusion, meditation. It is not opposed to social interest. You see, when you know that is, there is another profound significance of it. He becomes when he becomes a sannyasi, you become the nucleus individual around you, several the society bears around. As a sannyasi, as a monk, though you don't have an immediate family, there is a bigger family surrounding you. So they take inspiration from you. And success is 90% inspiration and 10% perspiration. So he doesn't cease to be a member of the society. Rather, he becomes a lead member of the society in helping the society, not in the way in he was doing as a householder to a small family and an immediate family, but as a bigger family. For him, not this small family is as important as the bigger family. So he becomes a part of the bigger family in taking the value lead, in giving the direction, giving the inspiration, giving a role model for his children in the family as well as his surrounding. So he is not detached from the society. The only difference is that though he lives in the society, he doesn't belong to a limited group called his own family. He becomes a part of a bigger family and has a bigger mission to play by way of inspiring, educating, you know, imparting knowledge to others by virtue of his own action. Even if a person sits in silence, at Puri also, there was a person who actually Tota Puri lived the last life in Puri, lived for 250 years. Now he was a certain Mauni Baba. He was not, no one has taught, heard him giving any preaching, but he had 3 lakh followers. People used to sit silently before him that they would get the answer to the problem and go back. So silence can also be a mode of communication, more eloquent than language. Mm -hmm. More eloquent than language. Your very presence inspires more. You know, your silence inspires more than your being garrulous and talkative. So that way, uh, there is a linkage of every individual with the society. Society doesn't mean the other. Yes, you brought in the concept of other. Now we have to find out who is the other. Now, when you are the you are a child, you say that my parents are the other. When you grow away from your bigger family, they are the your others, you have a duty for them. When you become more awakened and more socialized, then you find that yes, I have a duty also. If I have a little more surplus money, my neighbor's child, uh, son or daughter is unable to fill up the power, I have to share. Because they have, I am a trustee. The notion of trusteeship grows in you, think that yes, somehow, by God's grace of Almighty, certain things are with me. Though they are with me, they are not mine. The society has also a legitimate share in this. So the concept of being a head of the family, head of a not a small family, big family, gradually as you grow, that sense in that growth, ethical growth, moral growth comes. That moral growth comes. And you become more and more sensitive to the will and woe of your fellow men. And you belong to a society. You prioritize the interest your, uh, of others over your personal self is interest. It does not mean that you neglect your family. It does not mean there is no room for it because they are as much members of a society as others are. So you take the responsibility of a bigger society because you are free from the obligation of a small family. So you are free because children have taken over. So you take a so be responsible of a bigger family. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Malati Shriyan. Uh, yeah, good evening, sir. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, explanation. I loved it. Thank you so much. Uh, two two things I would like to say is, uh, first of all, you spoke about uh, uh, one in a minority religion, one man having multiple wives. So, but uh, we see that uh, uh, somehow 
due to their their values ethics moral and their intentions basically of converting from a um, minority country to uh, like uh, not being a hindu country but becoming a muslim country their uh, intention is not right they don't have the intention of universal loving and cumulative living together in a happy cordial living so that, that is one deviation i thought that yeah, I, would yeah, tell you. I got a question from your question i could know what details you are going ahead should i respond you see yes sir the inca our incapacity to follow the real spirit of morality does not undermine the importance of morality our failure to do it you know some people take advantage suppose i am honest some people take admi take advantage of my honest, the honesty that doesn't mean that honest suggests to virtue you see some people might this is a contingent fact it is it is simply shows that yes despite our best intentions and the best of ethical practices some people take advantage of it some people try to maximize their selfish interest or group interest that it is a fact but that fact doesn't undermine the uh, the the status of the moral behavior or morality or ethical injunctions i all that i were trying to say is this that a norm becomes objectively amenable objectively acceptable a society where women are women outnumber the men marrying more than one wife becomes a mandate and a society where the females outnumber the male one man should make, 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 make you know this is in history also so both are in two different kinds both are valid moral mandates but why they are moral because they promote social harmony that is the underlying strain that is the underlying refrain that anything which doesn't pr promote collective good is not good anything which is prejudicial to the collective good is immoral so that being the thumb rule we have to test to whether and to what extent whether and to what extent a particular injunction moral injunction or imperative or you know mandate is what's the name because some people misuse it at a particular point of time in history this possibility is the case history uh, it does not undermine the moral mandate of the society is any other question you want to ask uh, uh, dr fatima khatun are you here uh yes ma'am yes yes ma'am i am here go ahead uh, sir sir uh, my question is uh, folklore and uh, moral judgment folklore is the uh, depend on so, uh, that particular culture it is uh, that particular society to, which is not depend on that but is there any difference between them folklore and moral judgment because both are depend on social structure and social fact yeah and fact okay, is fact i, I get your point Yes, I get your point. I get your point okay. because once I know the your basics, I know the details. So, sorry for intervention. You are right, very very right. The folklores are nothing but, you know, the the people who create myths and mythologies. The folklores are great individuals, enlightened individuals. Now, folklores, you see, is a, is a method. There are different ways. Even Puranas may not have a historicity, but they have relevance. because through the stories practices conventions you know they try to educate the common mass now you see without knowing that learning they learn they elevate they refine the collective psyche so that way every you know there may could be certain things which have been introduced up extra which are harmful but by and large you will find if you analyze the folklores they have also a structure they have also a grammar they have also a common message to uplift the common man unlettered unexposed people how to and you find if you go to tribal areas you'll find they are more in harmony with nature than the urban people because respect for nature worship of nature before cutting a tree they will worship a tree these practices indirectly sensitize them about the nature around which is their habitat you see they are also have a elevating you know a person who doesn't know puranas why puranas came people who could not understand the nuances of the, the you know the, the our epics and uh, you know 
to, to make them make it intelligible through stories, titillating stories, titillating their imagination. A common man also listens to it, understands it in form of stories. And the stories are highly elevating. So the myths and mythology makers, people who are the authors of Huckleurs, are great, great people. Their intention was to uplift the society, not to corrupt the society. Uh, is uh, Ms. Sangeeta Jayas, are you here? Your question is in the chat yes, box. Ma yes, Please go ahead. Here. Thank go you. Ahead. Good evening, sir. Sir, in ethics, yes. sometimes we use the terms good and right as synonyms, but actually they are not synonyms. So could you please explain the basic difference between these terms, right and good? See, <clears throat> they are neighboring terms. You see, that which is good is, to, is bound to be right. Because something which causes by, by, you know, harm cannot be right. If you put it in the moral domain. Now, the right has also a use in non-moral domain. For example, you say, this is the right thing that you have done. This is the right question you have said. So this here, right means, means this is a question, the right question means a question which will, uh, easier, easier, easier for students to answer the right question. This is the right way. Supposing you are going in a wrong way, somebody says, no, that is not the wrong way. This is the right way. So right has also a wider use. Supposing you want to go to uh, the end of the jungle, so she said, brother, this is not the right way. This way goes to a different direction. This is the right way. So that's this here, the question of good is, is recessive, secondary. It means anything which leads to a destination that becomes right also. That is the right mode. Supposing that is right. Supposing somebody is teaching computer, you put your hands, uh, fingers on the wrong, you know, button. No, that is not right. This is right. Because you are learning computer, there's right and wrong is also a wider non-moral use. Good is also non-moral use. But if you distinguish between good and right, good is predominantly moral. Whereas right is predominantly amoral or you can say non-moral. That is the distinction. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Alok ji, would you like to add up anything? Are you here? Oh, I don't think I, I don't think he is there. Achha, if there are no further questions, then I'll just uh, uh, sum up. Uh, uh, Professor Aditya G, we heard you great. And if, actually, if I may, uh, before you, one, uh, yeah, one Alok, comment? yeah, Alok G, yeah, sure. Ah. Uh, first Alok G, uh, no, first Grant, and then I'll come to Alok G. Grant, go ahead. Uh, professor, very thought-provoking um, conversation we have here. So my my comment and question is really based off of clarification in the way that you're expressing universality and that I, I feel like how all of the comments and questions coming to you are missing the concept of the long-term expectation of actions. So to be a steward, as you're suggesting, we must consider the, the long-term replications of our, of our actions. And you even mentioned that, you know, morality matures as we consider the other. So when considering that timeline, you can look at to maybe the case of the extremity of evaluate, evaluation. So instead of, you know, good and bad, you look at what is better and worst in the extremities of that. You really consider the timeline of valuation. So for example, the community that has a surplus of men or women, they're going to consider having multiple wives or multiple husbands. The long-term goal would be to diversify the pool of children they're having so that they could have eventually one husband, one wife. Same thing with the students who evaluate the teacher as good or bad. If you consider the extreme evaluations and ask those same students, hey, are you considering this is the best teacher or the worst teacher? they would be able to come to a similar conclusion of, no, no, it's not the best teacher because they show up late. And the student who rated the teacher, this is a bad teacher, are they the worst? No, 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 they have great knowledge. Their lectures are great, but they show up late to class all the time. So you see when you're considering the extremities evaluation and the long-term consideration, 
of our actions and the repercussions of them, I feel like that's where the universality can really come into play with all the questions being asked. If you're considering the timeline that's involved with being the steward, then correct me if I'm wrong in interpreting what you're saying, that that's really where the universality comes from is considering the extremity evaluations. Should I respond? Yeah, please. Okay, brother, yes. If I got you properly, actually, I would like to simply uh, respond to you in this way. Morality, moral consciousness is other centric, other centric. So long as you take yourself as the end, everyone, your family members, everything is a means to promote your interest. There is ethicality, is, morality is not there. It is conspicuous by its absence. Morality is burned when you recognize the other before taking food. I have to give a small example. Suppose you have invited your friends for a lunch. Dentists and you know, you know, there is a sumptuous days prepared, but before you enter and you just ask your wife, do you have enough for you? Also something for you and something for the domestic help who has cooked. It's a moral behavior. You are going beyond your immediate interest. Are you thinking of the person who has cooked it, your wife? Because the Indian wives, you know, they take whatever is left over. They don't have a, some concept of legitimate share. They will live for the entire family. First to the Indian woman is first to get up and last to go. You know, the leftovers they take. But you ask, do you have enough? What about the what about the domestic health who has cooked it has got, got the fragrance of the you know dentist that he has, has prepared? She has a right. She has a legitimate right, legitimate share in the you know the the the, the, the dishes she has prepared. This is a moral behavior. So you recognize that beyond yourself there is an other morality is born. And morality is perfected when you live for the other. Yes, let me not me, but yourself. There is in, in, I remember in my young days there was a poem. There are two soldiers, they're friends, and they are equally thirsty. They get a cup of water just to you know satisfy. It's like one, one is that. And he's offering one friend is offering to the other, you take. So, no, no, you take. Thy necessity is greater than mine. Who is to write explanation of this? Thy necessity is. So when you prioritize the other, you become the means and the other become the end. The moral situation turns topsy turvy. When I live for other, but who is that other? Immediate number, yes. Community, yes. Human beings, yes. Human community, yes. Plants, yes. Because I know that I am more dependent on them than they are on us. It is said, even the last uh, tree is held, human beings will die of human Humanity will die of suffering in six hours. Lack of oxygen. So there is a book called by new men, little things that run the world. They say that we, we are more dependent on the non-human than non-humans. Perchance there is a cataclysmic event, all human beings die. Animals and birds will live in a bit, you know, happily. As it happened in case of Corona, people, you know, the animals and the birds used to go to the, you know, highway. So the point is, when we realize that we are more dependent on them, then we feel that we have a greater responsibility to protect them. So there is, so the morality goes beyond the timeline, beyond the special limitations and temporal limitations, not only our community, but the future generation. In Singapore, if you go in the summary, I saw it is written that leave the toilet cleaner than you found it. Leave the toilet cleaner than you found it. So leave the world a better place for your children. This becomes your moral duty. So your morality also extends beyond the contemporary, so you know, a fellow men or the society, it extends to future. As you rightly said, it is becomes universal. Universality can't articulate in a very specific way in a you know in a, in a conceptual framework, but universality means, and the true spirit of ethicality is this: yourself first. Thy necessity is greater than mine. That is why I told in the course of my talk today, he only lives who lives for others. So for he only I, I, I agree. I, I see exactly what you're saying, but I'm just trying to give a, a practical standpoint to give someone 
if you're trying to teach someone else to live for the other, that can be very abstract. But if you explain in terms of valuation of their actions for them to consider the extreme long term of their actions, would that be considerate to that that long term, you know, morality brother, and maturity of living yeah, for the other is ex considering yeah, yes, not brother. just the immediate return of, hey, we have enough food for me, but you know, do we have enough long term? in the extremity of that excess would that be a practical way of interpreting what you're saying as living for yes. the other to consider valuation in the extremities of your actions yes brother this uh, living for the other is the only existential option because if i try to live not for the other at the cost of the other the conflicts will ensue and we will have a place we will have a world, we will have a family, we will have a community where I try to live at the cost of others. Could be my wife, could be my children, could be my community, could be my never. It will create, it will sow these seeds of discord, you know, dissension. So that is the living for the other. But as you grow, then you have discover who is the other, who is my kindred. Maybe that you are my immediate kindred because you are participating in the seminar. But beyond this also we have a relationship. Beyond this, I have a relationship to others who are not academically open or, you know, you know, that alive and that are awakened. I have a duty for them. So as you grow, you know, humanity also grows. The collective psyche, there is something called collective psyche. But this collective psyche, how does it mature? Through suffering. You see, after felling trees, you are, you are conscious of the value of the tree. Each one plant one. So humanity commit, commits a mistake, then only learns from it. So as we go on committing mistakes, just as a man who flouts the health rules and falls sick, he's more conscious of health rules. A sick man is more conscious of health rules than a healthy man. So humanity by committing follies and follies, you know, Himalayan follies has disturbed the planet, has made artificial divisions. Despite, you know, globalization, the physical sphere, there is a, you know, this is a paradox that we have created artificial barriers in the name of Hindu divide, Hindu non-Hindu, Muslim non-divides. There are artificial, we are not globalized, we are global in the physical sphere. I am talking to you, I do not know where are you from, but I am talking to you. Also, I am seeing you, talking to you, you are communicating. This is a digital barbell. This is mobile, you know, so the point is, yes, we are globalized, but in the physical plane, psychically we are fragmented. And these are two diametrically opposite things. So in this sense, if you talk of cosmic society, this is the only valid discourse. It may sound utopian, but there is no other way for survival. As I told, the choice is either we live together or die together because we are so enormously empowered that if I kill my never in the process, I also get myself effaced. So we are living in such a society. We are huddled in a village, global village. We have to take care of, think of everyone. When I think of everyone, I am also part of it. My interest is. So that is the only route for survival of the human race. Humanity willingly will have to abandon sectarianism, religious fanaticism, communal you know, sentiments, These are because they have paid price for it. So now anyone who talks of cosmocentrism, showing that this is the way of survival, everyone will embrace it. New literature should would come. And our scripture should be, you know, the, we, people will again reopen the pages of the scriptures and say, oh, this is the message, great master's gift. And we have ignored, we are paying price for it. Mm -hmm. So, morality is bound to be universal. More when morality grows, is bound to bring more and more within its embrace or grasp. That is the natural growth of morality. I mean, initially we talked about only human beings. Now a time has come with the warming of the planet, warming of the planet and melting of the polar ice and acid rain and all that. We are bound to think of a society where ecology is also respected, plants, animals, flora, fauna, thinking that they are also integral part of my life. And unless they live well, unless they have a protective existence, then my existence is in jeopardy. That's oh. it. Alok ji. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Shinkala ji. Because of some net uh, connectivity problems, I could not hear this wonderful lecture of Professor Mohanty. But some, a few questions come to my mind, very small pointed ones. First is that when 
Mohanty sir says that uh, morality or ethics is dependent upon the ontology, then there are many, many types of ontologies. How can there be an universal ethics derived from the, the different intimate? ontologies? This is so, my first question. Complete within one minute. Yeah. So you first question was that that since there are so many ontologies, when you say that ethics is derived from ontology, then how can we have an universal ethics? with so much of differentiation in the ontologies. This is my first question. And the mm -hmm. second one is that uh, there are certain attempts, if I remember well, to develop ethics without ontology. I think Patnam. And uh, also the uh, Levinas may be uh, in that category, I don't know. But the question is, can there be ethics without ontology? Why not? Yes. Yes. Because when when we treat ethics as a certain uh, thing like social, then there is no need for, I think, and for when you always say that it is the other, the concern for the other, so for the concern of for the other, why do we need some ontology? Yeah. Another third question is, and that is uh, very much related to present day conditions, that why not people opt for moral living? Why so much conflict when you say that we will live together or die together? This I agree. This is my own wish also. This is also my, it is very inspiring. But why this is not practically possible? There are two okay. wars going on in the world. And, and okay. we cannot decide which side is the moral side. Thank you. Okay, okay Alokji, uh, let me try because uh, there is only one percent I am still uh, it is on. So let me uh, hope that yes, I continue to give your uh, succeeding answer. Now, first of all, there are plurality of ethical paradigms and each one of them draws its rationale from a particular ontology. So, plurality of ontologies give rise to, I gave the example of a matter-centric ontology and cosmocentric ontology, centric ontology to substantiate my contention. So, brother, it is, if something is true, what we is concerned with the truth. There cannot be, you see, either earth moves around the sun or the sun moves around, either geocentric or not, both cannot be right. So that is also true in case of ontologies. Now, in course of being lived, ethical life implied by the ontology, humanity becomes disillusioned about those myopic ontologies. You see, matter-centric ontologies, yes, it will give you prosperity, matter. but the point is when it is a question of Cosmocentric living, finding mind in matter, consciousness in matter, finding life in the plant and life in the you know so-called inanimate object, it is this cosmocentric concern will come, will stem from a cosmocentric ontology. So a universal value system, which the society needs now today, calls for a universal ontology, a cosmo cosmocentric ontology, which in my considered opinion, you know that which considers unity and diversity, uh, you know, under, un, un, undermines the distinction of names and forms, for example, I will tell you. Is there any link uh, in any diagnostic equipment? Which can, there are 110 types of blood tests. Can, by looking at the blood, can anyone say whether it's Christian or Muslim? Untouchable or is it possible taking blood, PET scans? Because it is not in nature, it is superimposed. It is created by man. The even religion when religions were not there, Buddhism 2500 years back, neither neither Buddhism nor Jainism nor Christianity nor Islam. 6000 years before, there was no Hinduism at all because if Vedas were not written, it's a fact we have to recognize. And human civilization is 10,000 years old on this planet. 10,000 years back, we were all 
uh, the neighbors of the you know animals and birds so the when there's a conflict of ontologies that on the test is pragmatics that ontology which entails an ethical framework which accommodates more and more sorts out irons out differences saying that they are superficial they are not though we differ in respect of our physiognomy language religion we profess in a language we speak but deep within we are all human beings you see here you are going to locate an underlying universal among all human beings going beyond you find that here there is a life system not only in human beings but the plants and animals so biocentrism came now a time comes when it is a cosmocentrism so it is a question of growth moral growth to understand the understand the inadequacies in inbuilt inadequacies of different ontologies so only the cosmocentric ontology will be proved viable because cosmocentric ontology will give rise to social ethics which you can live together your second question was can one can one can you not have an ethics which is ontology neutral brother if you look you know you know you have a closer reflection into those paradigms those social paradigms which talk of help you'll find there are two things let's take the example of marxist ethics now marxist ethic people say that it is ontology neutral no it is tethered to a matter centric ideology matter matter is the ultimate economic conditions are the only determining factors this is ontology this is a world view it is not that economic contradictions are primary contradictions but hypothetically the economic contradictions are resolved reconciled then psychic contradiction religious divides will be there after the economic when people get everything they need so economic contradiction is not the only so it is a defective ontology so whenever you suppose you say that let us solve human beings you are presuming that human beings are the, our fellow men we are the privileged people this is an ontology so willingly you are subscribing to an ontology any action for that matter the way i act and interact with others presupposes an ontology whether you accept or not on ours a kind of world view tempers my action and thinking and uh, second point unless and until you have subscribed to you have some conviction or you have a built in faith in some 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 kind of identity when is diversity your inspiration to serve others will die out so it is the ontology which in form of conviction which lends inspiration to your way of life so in that way ethics is essentially bound up with some kind of ontology or the other brother what was the last question what was the last question there are two questions i remember i think there is some corollary some I can't see him anymore. Okay. Oh, okay, nice. so mm -hmm. uh, it's okay. Uh, in case if he's not here, then there's no point in uh, answering his question either. Uh, all right. I see several other professors, but uh, I think we have exceeded the time. And may I request uh, the coordinator to wind up the session? Oh, yes. <coughs> Professor Aditya Mohande, Professor Paneer Salvam, Professor Prashant Shukla. Professor Alok Tandon and Professor Srikla Nayar for the fruitful interaction. It has been benefited a lot. And thanks to the dear participants for your queries. And now let me invite Ms. Ramya Chandran, General Secretary, GFIP, to propose the official vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Shimi. Uh, at the close of the session, uh, let me express my heartfelt gratitude on behalf of the Global Forum for Young Philosophers to the distinguished speaker of the day, Professor Aditya Mohante who beautifully uh, articulated and presented his thoughts in, on normative and metanormative ethics and its allied concepts. Uh, as we have seen, he has succeeded in evoking a number of questions in everyone's mind. And there, and if there are more, we can even continue the discussion in the WhatsApp group of GFIP. We can continue the discussion. Let, let the discussion continue. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are indeed great, uh, grateful to have you today with us. You thank me. I'm grateful. Thank you, sir. Let thank me you. also thank uh, Professor Shrikala Nair, the torch bearer of GFIP. Uh, as we know, it's her vision that gets manifested as various programs of the forum. Thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for being with us always. My pleasure and privilege. Uh, I don't know about that. Thank you. Thank you. We should hang up now.
yeah thank I you think... thank you so much thank, thank you so much please finish okay. let me also thank uh, dr ling kyung gambi for uh, introducing the team and also other senior professors we were privileged to have dr Pan professor panin selvam uh, dr prashant shukla and many more dr alok tandon uh, thanks to each one of you and also the participants and everyone who has joined us today thank you all and i have a good day thank you everyone thank you thank you all do join us for the next month session as well thank you dhanyawad aha much much dhanyawad aha dhanyawad aha